Here I am today uh, in the best field, the driest field and the largest field on the farm. Um, this field from perimeter to perimeter is just over six acres. Uh, very dry field, underlaid, about two and a half feet under. Uh, this is limestone quarry. Um, you can see where the quarries were being dug over the years. They used to burn the lime. Uh, I believe it was a great lime if it was burned properly. Um, this field is unique and this uniqueness can be seen from uh, aerial photography or satellite in that it was mounded. Now I know that the New Zealanders do a lot of mounding but it's very hard to probably see this on the camera, on the video. But the field is mounded in approximately seven foot wide mounds the whole way across almost to the hedge. Uh, my father used to say that long ago when they were set in or so in grain because the soil was shallow it wasn't very deep they'd mound it up to help bring on the grain and give it as much nutrition as possible now it has been the bane of our lives i suppose over the years bringing in bales and stuff for there was many a load of bale <laughs> bales met uh, a sad end here and we had to rebuild them on the trailer but this is a field i will never plow and i'll tell you the reason i'll never plow it number one is the driest field it's extremely dry, even in the winter, unless it's a very inclement and there's a lot of heavy rain, you could leave cattle out in it, which I never do. But I also think you judge the field by the type of grass, and the best way to see that is where cows have manured. You get an indication of the type of grass. Now, there's a prime example there. It's, um, it's a sort of a lush grass. Now, there's a mixture of species in there, including mm. scutches and... Uh, I have taken some samples actually to give me an idea of what's already here but the other significant thing and the most significant thing about this is the level of clover. Um, clover is one of the most dominant species in this ground. Um, that's why the cattle, even if it's bare, the cattle will actually eat uh, here down to the clay as they say. So you can see like it's very small clover, it's actually a small leaf clover, there's no large leaf clover in here but um, there's a lot of it. And um, that's one of the reasons that when I have clover in the swart, it's the starting point it should be. You can see here how tight the swart is actually with all that clover. It's a very tight. The only problem is the species of grass that are present. Now I've walked this field for an hour and I've taken a few samples of what is the predominant grasses here. I'm not 100% sure, but I do know that they're not high quality. This here, Yorkshire fog, not a great grass. To have in a field. A little bit of perennial rye grass. The reason that probably came in is that there was bales brought in maybe or the cattle were eating silage with a bit of perennial rye grass in it and when they manured on it it came out on the land here. This here is a very good sodden grass. It's a bent grass. I think it's common bent they call that. And this could be dog's tail. I'm not 100% certain. I'd have to check on my encyclopedia of grasses but all in all you're not talking about very productive grasses here. The problem here is that once there comes three inches of grass and I let the cattle on this, there's no return. Because once they eat it low, it takes a long, long time to return. So what I intend to do with this is number one, I intend to top the rushes or mow them and they'll have to be licked when they regrow. Everything will have to be licked. There's no other way around it. Um, I wouldn't spray anything. I prefer to lick. Now, when I clean the field, my idea is and I, I, I've yet to, to I suppose fl flesh this out I want to be able to minimum till in some shape or form better grasses for example the fescues, medifescu, timothy some perennial rye grass into the swarts how I do that I have yet to figure out now I am building a simple machine for the back of the tractor that would literally it's a type of harrow and there's tines on the back it might just scrape enough channels so that I could seed it the other thing, what I might do, um, I might experiment with getting a power harrow just to skim the surface of the mounds. And if I was only to sow a fraction, maybe 40 or 50% of the field with that or in areas where there's no rushes after they're licked, it would be a good way of introducing new grasses, increasing the productivity. Uh, the other thing I intend to do at the bottom, uh, there's a lot of mounds of clay and it's quite wet. Um, I hope to have worked that into the land so that this is all one complete field 
and then I hope to turn it for the first time in its history into a meadow because I think it's important to rotate the way the organic farmers do the rotate there is no such thing as continuous meadow or continuous pasture it's healthier for the land you're getting a better spread of organic fertilizer this is the reason this is actually so rich is the amount of manure that's on it I mean it's amazing the amount over the last 100 years that cattle have left on this so bone dry high in clover not great grasses good sodding grasses but not great um, nutritional grasses for, for to um, drive on performance in cattle so that's our starting point and it's a matter now of addressing the issues of weed management and control and then how we introduce the new grasses and the, that's the plan anyway so that could be for next year but I have to work on how to introduce the grasses and I think this could make a great field of this already clover in place already a good enough sodding grass dry field um, no fertiliser I haven't put fertiliser on this in years um, so that's the plan and I'm going to work on it and see what we come up with